Well, hello again, everyone. My name is JB with Not By Works Ministries, and today we're going to take a look at part four of this video series entitled, What Lies Ahead? An Overview of the Olivet Discourse. So we are working our way through this famous teaching of our Lord from the Mount of Olives uh, on the night before he was betrayed. So this was Wednesday night of that famous Passion Week that ultimately led him to the cross where he paid uh, the atoning sacrifice for our sins and rose again the third day. And so this is very near the end of his ministry. And we've been uh, kind of taking a look at this uh, passage from Matthew's account. Now the Olivet Discourse, as it's called, is recorded by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, it's recorded in Luke 21 and Mark 13. But Matthew's account is by far the most extensive and detailed. And that makes sense, of course, because Matthew was written to a predominantly Jewish audience to prove uh, that Jesus is the Messiah, the long-awaited one who would take the throne. And although throughout all of the synoptic gospel accounts uh, of Jesus' life and ministry, uh, they emphasize the kingdom and the fact that Jesus is going to come and inaugurate an earthly messianic kingdom, Matthew, more so than the others, uh, gives us some richness of detail and, and uh, some, some details that uh, the others do not. And, uh, you know, each gospel writer included selected events from the life and ministry of Christ for a particular purpose. That's what gospel literature is. Uh, a gospel a narrative is a particular type of historical narrative that records uh, certain events and puts them in a particular order to make a theological point. And Matthew's point in the 28 chapters of Matthew is to prove that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the long-awaited messianic hope, the one who was promised for centuries to come and take the throne and rule with a rod of iron in perfect peace and justice. And it's this kingdom that Jesus is addressing in the Olivet Discourse, because as we've said previously, and by the way, I encourage you, if you've not watched the first three videos in this series, I would encourage you to take the time to go back and watch those for some context, because we won't have time to do a whole lot of review for each one of these videos. We want to spend uh, the, mo the balance of our time on the actual new portion that we're dealing with today. But, but just by way of brief review, uh, the, the whole Olivet Discourse is basically Jesus' answer to the disciples' question, uh, what will be the sign of your coming? It is entirely Jewish in nature. Um, you know, the disciples uh, had been obsessed with the kingdom throughout Jesus' earthly ministry. They asked him questions about it. They wanted to know who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom, who's going to sit where in the kingdom. Jesus had repeatedly affirmed the literal nature of the kingdom. He had promised them they would sit on 12 thrones with him in the future kingdom. And never once did he deny the literal nature of the kingdom. And so uh, here they are on the outskirts of Jerusalem, uh, and uh, headed into Jerusalem the day before the triumphal entry. And Luke tells us in Luke 19 that they thought the kingdom was going to appear immediately. You know, they'd been with him for three and a half years. He had told them the kingdom was at hand. Uh, here they are. It's Passover week. Uh, surely this must be the time when he's going to throw off the shackles of Rome and usher in this long-awaited uh, kingdom in fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise. But, uh, um, but it wasn't to be. The timing uh, was not yet. And so the Lord uh, begins to uh, tell them in more explicit terms, uh, gradually toward the end of his ministry, about the fact that he must go to the cross before he can wear the crown, that uh, suffering uh, comes before victory. And uh, so, uh, indeed, that's what happened. A few people, as he rode into Jerusalem that day, uh, cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, in fulfillment of Psalm 118. But uh, within days, those cries, as we know, changed to crucify him, crucify him, and they crowned him with thorns. And so this uh, uh, delay, as it were, between the inauguration of the kingdom and his first coming, this inter-advent age, as we call it, uh, is something that the Old Testament clearly predicted. Remember, we went to Daniel's uh, prophecy in Daniel uh, chapter 9, and we talked about how even Daniel himself predicted there would be a gap of time between the 69th week and the 70th week in his prophecy, or the 483rd year and the beginning of the 484th year. And, uh, and then the New Testament comes along and it gives us more information about what's going to happen in that gap of time. Um, you know, the, New Te the Old Testament never uh, mentions the church explicitly by name. You don't find the word church mentioned in the Old Testament. But you do clearly find uh, you know, this, this gap of time. And then as God continued to unveil more about his plan uh, to us on earth, 
in the New Testament, he began to give us some specific details about what's going to happen in this inter-Advent age. So we often call the church age a parenthesis within God's plan for Israel. And that's precisely what it is, if you want to use that grammatical metaphor, because there's a 490-year plan that that God very clearly revealed to Daniel, the first 483 years of it, as we talked about previously, were fulfilled literally, to the day, in fact. And then the final seven years will also be fulfilled literally, uh, but they haven't happened yet. Uh, nothing whatsoever about that final seven-year period, as it is later detailed in, in the book of Revelation, and as Jesus is detailing here in the Olivet Discourse, nothing about that has happened yet. Indeed, it could not have happened, because Daniel tells us very plainly that the final seven years won't begin until the Antichrist uh, is unveiled. And we, don't, we haven't had that yet. We don't know who the Antichrist is. He has not been uh, unveiled. And the Antichrist is a literal historical person, just as Artaxerxes, the, the, uh, king, the Persian king who started the 490-year clock ticking in March 5th, 444 B.C., just as he was a literal historical figure, similarly the Antichrist will be. And we see that repeatedly talked about in the New Testament. 1 John 2.18 tells us that during this present evil age that we call the church age, that the Bible calls the church age, um, we're going to see many Antichrists come, but 1 John 2.18 says there is one Antichrist, capital A, who will come at the end of the age. And Jesus is talking about uh, this Antichrist in the Olivet Discourse when he gets to the abomination of desolation and so forth. So um, the church age is a mystery. It's not something that uh, it, the disciples in the first century could have understood. It did not get fully unveiled until the Apostle Paul explains it in the book of Ephesians. Uh, I am uh, uh, preaching a message uh, coming up uh, on at a conference in Minnesota entitled um, The Beginning nature and future, or the nature, beginning, and future of the church. And uh, it's all about this mystery plan of God during the present church age. And so if you're listening to this on the internet, uh, by the time you listen to it, that message will also be available, uh, and you can check out the audio and also the video of that in the weeks to come. Uh, so uh, Jesus is not talking about the church at all. In fact, as we said, if you look at the end times plan, and you look at the Olivet Discourse in eschatological context, he's not talking about the present church age. That wasn't even on the radar screen yet. It had not been unveiled yet. It had not started yet. Uh, and you can prove exegetically, by the way, that the church did not start until Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. Well, that happened uh, some 50 plus days after the words that we're looking at here from Jesus to the disciples in the Olivet Discourse. So he clearly was not speaking about things that will take place during the present age. Rather, he's talking about things that will take place during that future seven-year period, as you see on the screen there, the 70th week of Daniel, the 70th week of Daniel. So we looked uh, previously at the first 14 verses of Matthew chapter 24, and we said, in that section of the Olivet Discourse and the corresponding sections in Mark and Luke, Jesus is giving general signs that will characterize the entire seven-year period of the tribulation. And then in the next section, he zeroes in on specific, more detailed signs that will uh, take place in the second half of the seven-year tribulation. And then finally, uh, he's going to take a look at some very detailed, amazing things that will happen precisely at the moment that Jesus uh, comes back. Uh, those signs that, that accompany the very second coming of Christ. And so uh, we looked previously at this first section uh, and, and got through the first 14 verses. And we said, essentially, uh, there are three sections, if you want to break up. There's 12 sections overall, as I see the Olivet Discourse outlined. The first section was verses 1 and 2, where the disciples are once again obsessed with the temple and the beauty of it, and then Jesus rebukes, uh, not doesn't really rebuke them, but sort of indirectly rebukes them when he says, oh, the temple's going to be destroyed. Not one stone will be left upon another. And then that prompts the disciples' questions there in verse 3, which is the second section of the Olivet Discourse, uh, in which uh, Jesus basically, uh, or the disciples basically say, well, wait a minute, Lord, uh, if the temple's going to be destroyed, how in the world can you usher in the kingdom? And when will all of these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming? When will we know the kingdom is going to come? And then, then the, the Olivet Discourse in earnest begins in section 3 here with verses 4 to 14, as we said, that in which Jesus gives general signs 
general signs about the entire tribulation period. Now, before we get to the fourth section, um, I felt like we, uh, with that last verse there, verse 14 of section 3, we kind of went over fairly quickly at the end of our last video, and I didn't feel like we did it justice. So I want to come back and just walk through it again. Uh, so uh, again, I encourage you to watch the previous video, watch all of the previous videos, uh, but also uh, this is a good review of that one particular section. So in verses 13 and 14, Jesus says, He who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Now a couple of things uh, about this verse. First of all, I want you to notice that this promise here in verse 14, that the gospel will be preached to all the world and then the end will come, is a promise that will not be fulfilled until the tribulation period. Uh, now, sometimes people struggle with that a little bit, as if somehow I'm minimizing or marginalizing the Great Commission in the present church age. And in no way am I doing that. The church is absolutely charged with sharing the gospel globally right now. That's the reason we're here. Indeed, we are center stage in God's kingdom, in God's uh, program, rather, right now. We are the ones that are supposed to be His envoys. We are, as Paul said, to shine like lights in this perverse generation. And if you think about God's plan of the ages, in every age, God has a particular person or people group that he has set aside for the sole purpose of representing his glory and spreading the gospel. And for a long period of time, that was the nation of Israel. But as Paul tells us in Romans chapter 11, God has temporarily set Israel aside during this inter-advent age and ushered in a new envoy, and that is the church, you and I. And we are indeed supposed to go and share the gospel to the uttermost parts of the world. However, there's no promise in Scripture that that will succeed prior to the rapture. It may. We hope it does. But we do know that currently there are still many millions of unreached people groups uh, throughout the world. There are places in the world that have not heard the gospel, and that's why mission work is so important. That's why by, not by works exist. We don't do a lot of global missions, uh, but we do go throughout the entire country, uh, all 50 states, and we go to places where every time we speak, there are people present who, believe it or not, even in this world and even in this country, have not heard the gospel. And by the way, that's becoming more and more common. Very common indeed. Uh, because we live in a postmodern age where Christianity is being overshadowed by a, a lack of absolute truth. And so it's amazing the number of places we go where people have not heard the gospel. Just last Sunday I preached uh, somewhere and a person came up to me afterwards and had never really heard the simplicity of the grace message. And they thought you had to work your way into heaven. And here they live in, in mainstream America. And so the church is absolutely charged with sharing the gospel. But all I'm saying is we do not have a promise in Scripture that says that the rapture won't happen until everybody's heard the gospel. Because remember, as we've said repeatedly, the rapture is a signless event. It is imminent. It could happen at any time. There is no prophecy that must be fulfilled or no thing that must occur prior to the rapture. And so we, we dare not sit back and say, for example, well, I know the rapture won't happen today because there's still unreached people groups. No, in fact, it's just the opposite. We need to all the more urgently share the gospel because there are unreached people groups and the rapture could happen today. And then there will be those left behind who have never believed the gospel. And by the way, not hearing the gospel does not give you an excuse. Romans chapter 1 makes it very clear that those who have uh, that, that, that everybody is without excuse because God has revealed himself in nature. But general revelation, nature, providence, conscience, general revelation is not enough to secure eternal salvation. You must hear the gospel. Uh, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes it. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So absolutely, people must hear the gospel. And if a person dies without hearing the gospel, they will spend eternity in, in hell because they've never trusted in Jesus Christ and him alone for salvation. So there's an urgency to our task. That's why at Not By Works, one of our uh, part of our mission statement is the accuracy, clarity, and urgency of the gospel message. So no, uh, we, we cannot sit back and say, well, I know the rapture won't happen today because the, God, the, God, the people still need to hear the gospel. Uh, nor can we say that if someone hasn't heard the gospel, they automatically go to heaven. Because, by the way, if not hearing the gospel guarantees you heaven, then the best thing we could do would be to never share the gospel with anyone. Because according to that line of reasoning, the minute you share the gospel with someone, now they're accountable. 
And so Jesus doesn't say, hey, keep it a secret because I want people to be protected. Uh, don't tell anybody the gospel because then they'll have to believe it. And if they don't, they'll go to hell. He says, go tell them because not hearing the gospel is the same as not believing the gospel because you cannot believe something that you have not heard. In fact, Paul makes this point exactly in almost those terms in Romans uh, chapter 10. If you remember, uh, Paul says, How shall they call on him, talking about Israel, in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe, watch this, on him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So absolutely, we need to share the gospel. But Jesus' promise here in Matthew 24, 14, is talking about a different time. And even though we cannot say that that with certainty that everyone on earth will have heard the gospel before the rapture, we can say with absolute certainty that everyone on earth will have heard the gospel before the second coming. And that's the purpose of the 144,000 Jewish witnesses that we read about in Revelation 7 during this seven-year tribulation period. They will go to the uttermost parts of the earth, everyone will hear the gospel, and then Jesus says, then the end will come. So God's timing is always perfect, and somehow that seven-year tribulation ends precisely uh, after everyone has heard the gospel. Now, we know that during that seven-year tribulation period, many people will reject the gospel. They'll take the mark of the beast. They won't believe the gospel, the good news. Uh, but many will. There will be an incredible harvest of souls uh, that takes place during that seven-year tribulation period prior to the start of the kingdom from every nation, tribe, tongue, and language, and praise God for it. But look at verse 13 on the screen there. He who endures to the end will be saved. I wanted to just remind you that the word saved does not mean gain eternal salvation. In fact, as we've said, the word saved frequently means, more than half the time, deliverance from physical danger, sickness, or harm. And what Jesus is talking about here is that during that future seven-year period, things are going to get worse and worse. It's going to be unbelievable tribulation. In fact, Jesus says if, it, if, if the, those days weren't shortened, that nobody would survive, that everybody on earth would die. The entire uh, human race would be wiped out if those days were not, uh, did not come to an end. Uh, that's how bad it's going to be. And here he's just mentioning that those who physically survive, that's what endures means, physically survives, uh, to the end of the seven-year period, will be the ones who are delivered into the kingdom. Uh, now again, as believers in the church age, we will have been rescued before the great and terrible day of the Lord. We, we won't be here on earth during the seven-year period. We will come back at the end of the seven-year period to rule and reign with Christ. But the meaning of the word saved does not mean eternal salvation. It just means to deliver, to rescue, or to save. The noun is the same thing, deliverance or salvation. And it's used 107 times in the verb form in the New Testament. And as I mentioned, more than half of those, 58% to be exact, it, it clearly refers to physical deliverance from harm, sickness, or danger. 33 times, 33 times, so less than 30%, it refers to eternal salvation. Now, And then 11 times, it refers to entrance into the kingdom as it does in this passage here. And the context makes that very, very clear. So the English words save and salvation are not technical terms that refer to individual eternal salvation. We often think of them that way, and, and in our English, you know, Western American Christianity, that's the way we use it. You know, you talk about, hey, I, I got saved when I was six years old, or when did you get saved, or how long have you been saved, or did anybody get saved at the revival the other night? But in the Bible, we've got to use, you know, we've got to use English words with Bible definitions. And in the Bible, the word saved most of the time means physical salvation, physical deliverance, as it does here. Jesus is talking about who's going to inhabit the earth uh, when he comes back to establish the kingdom. So context always determines meaning. We looked at several verses last week that illustrate this. For example, Matthew 8, 25, when the storm arose on the Sea of Galilee and the, Lord, and the disciples said, Lord, save us. We're perishing. Well, they certainly did not mean, Lord, give us eternal life. We're going to hell. They just meant, hey, we're in danger. Rescue us from this storm because we're about to drown. Sometimes the word sozo is translated healed. Healed like it is here in Mark 5, 23. Come and lay your hands on her and she may be healed and she will live. Uh, in John 11, uh, in the context of uh, Lazarus' death, they said, uh, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. That is, if he dies, he will, you know, he will come back to life. Physical deliverance. Um, Paul on the, on the boat when it was about to be shipwrecked on the island of Malta, 
He said, when all hope that we would be saved was finally given up, was Paul giving up hope of going to heaven here? Was he saying, when all hope that we would go to heaven was given up? Of course not. So again, you see these over and over again. We looked at these last week. But when you when you see the word save or salvation in your English translation of the Bible, always ask yourself, saved from what? Saved from what? We did an extended uh, series uh, audio series, I believe, recently on James chapter 2. And one of the big problems with James 2, 14 to 26 is people make the same mistake there that they do in Matthew 24, 13. They assume that save means eternal salvation, even though nothing in the context ever references heaven, hell, or eternity. And, and, and indeed, the context does reference repeatedly in James chapters 1 and 2. In fact, all throughout James, all five chapters, uh, it was talking about physical, uh, temporal, earthly issues. So again, when we come back to Matthew 24, 13 and 14, what Jesus is saying is that he who endures to the end will be saved and the end will come and that's the sign of my coming. So he sort of has summed up his opening arguments, if you will, in answer to the question, when will the kingdom come? So Matthew 24, 4 to 14 provides general signs that relate to the entire future seven-year tribulation period. And then you get uh, Jesus sort of zeroing in uh, on uh, the second section. So that was the first section, and then you get to the second section, and he's going to say, now, when you see these signs, you know, watch out, because it's getting even closer. It's getting even closer. So let's take a look at uh, verses 15 to 26. Jesus says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, and then he, Matthew adds, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. In other words, when you see the abomination of desolation, look out. Now, it's very, very significant that Jesus quotes Daniel by name, because uh, perhaps no other Old Testament prophet has been so maligned and so ridiculed and criticized as Daniel. Uh, it's because his prophecies were so meticulously accurate, as we saw with Daniel chapter 9. I mean, even down to the day, um, and, and liberal scholars who don't believe the Bible could make such predictions have to, to then um, criticize, <coughs> criticize Daniel and say, oh, he must have been written, you know, years later. He must have been written after some of these things uh, happened, particularly uh, the prophecies about Antiochus Epiphanes and so forth. Uh, so, But no, not at all. Jesus himself, speaking prophetically, uh, aligns himself with Daniel when he talks about the abomination of desolation. So let's look at our end times chart. Um, if you see the abomination of desolation right there in the middle, that happens at the midpoint of the tribulation. So... Uh, Jesus has already kind of given some general signs that will be characteristic of the entire seven-year period. But now he says, hey, when you see this one critical event, uh, you know that things are going to go from bad to worse, and it's getting ever closer to my return. And indeed, that's what's going to happen. So if you uh, parallel this uh, to the book of Revelation, and we did some of that in the previous video as we looked at Revelation chapter 6 and the very clear correlation to the Olivet Discourse, but if you look at the overall uh, details from Revelation chapters 6 to 18 about what's going to take place in the tribulation, uh, what we see is uh, just uh, a relative, in, you know, not relative, a very dramatic intensification of the wrath of God being poured out on mankind and the wrath of Satan being perpetrated against the nation of Israel and all believers during the tribulation period. And the abomination of desolation is sort of the, the peak moment of that. That's at that point that the Antichrist, who has been ruling the world, um, and in terms of globally there had been relative peace and protection for Israel in the first three and a half years, when you get to the second three and a half years after the abomination of desolation, it's like the gloves come off. He demands that everybody worship him. He claims that he is God. Um, he, he, he wreaks havoc on the world. He, he, he issues one world uh, you know, economy where you have to you know, have the mark to buy and sell. And it's just a terrible, terrible uh, time. And I take it that the trumpet and bowl judgments both take place during the second half of the tribulation as things intensify. And then Jesus goes on to say, during this time, the second half of the tribulation, let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house, and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days, and pray that your flight might not be in winter or on the Sabbath. 
All he's saying there, and again, this very clearly indicates the Jewish nature of the tribulation, because why would Gentiles and members of the church care about whether it's on the Sabbath? Now, we don't celebrate the Sabbath today. Indeed, the only one of the Ten Commandments that's never repeated a single time, not one time in the New Testament, is remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, because we're not under the law. Uh, we worship on Sundays, the, the first day of the week. Uh, we don't keep the Sabbath. It's never mentioned in the New Testament. And nor do we keep any other of the Jewish laws. But in the tribulation, once Israel once again returns to center stage and the temple is rebuilt and, and, and Israel is kind of the focus of the world's attention, then of course uh, the, these you know, sa uh, sacrifices and laws and things are going to be back in play again. And so Jesus here, as he would naturally do if he was speaking to a Jewish audience, is talking about things that might concern you if you're alive on the earth at that time. He says, look, when you see the abomination of desolation, head for the hills, and, and you better pray that you're not pregnant. It would be harder to, to, to flee if that happens. Uh, and pray that it's not in the winter. It would be harder to, to travel in the winter. And pray that it's not on the Sabbath when you wouldn't be able to travel very far because of Jewish regulations. And then he says, then there will be great tribulation, verse 21. Great tribulation, such as has not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. This is one of the reasons that uh, I think it's very clear that the, the current events going on around us are not, in fact, the fulfillment of the tribulation, I mean, of the Olivet Discourse prophecies. Because as bad as they are, there's nothing that's happening today, uh, globally, that hasn't happened before, even worse. Uh, I do believe worse times are coming. But I mean, when you go back through history, and, and Edmund Burke famously said, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. Uh, I think it's, it's instructive to go back and learn from the mistakes of the past. But you look at history, you look at men like Stalin and Hitler and Pol Pot and Mao and all of these ruthless dictators, you know, even back in, into the ancient times, you know, you think of uh, the Roman Empire and um, you know, all of the things that happened, the, the Persians and the Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, there have been unbelievable, terrible times before, and, and there will be in the future. But nothing will compare to what's going to take place when the church is rescued from this present evil age, when the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit is uh, taken out of this world for uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and, uh, and Satan is at the helm. Um, I mean, this is already the devil's playground. But uh, it's going to be unprecedented. Nothing. He says, when this happens, there will have never been anything uh, like it. Uh, he says there in verse 21. Now, some people, I might mention, try to distinguish between the tribulation and the great tribulation because they make this phrase great tribulation into a technical term. But it's not a technical term. It's a descriptive term. And what he's saying is that the tribulation that's already taking place is going, going to get worse. And indeed, that's precisely what's uh, going to happen. And then he says, unless God ends the tribulation, uh, no, no living thing would remain alive. He says, and, and unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Now, this does not mean that the period will be less than three and a half years, nor does it mean that an individual day will be less than 24 hours in length. I've seen that in some of the commentaries and writings, and that's just an unfortunate, naive handling of this passage. What Jesus is saying is that this seven-year period, the 70th week of Daniel, which he's already referenced, is not, is not, uh, is going to be so bad that if it did not end, then everything on earth would die up. That's how bad it is. Um, you know, Antichrist is going to target the Jews, and, and, the, and then Jews who believe in Jesus particularly, and, and, and great multitudes of people will perish because of the distress that uh, he precipitates. The elect there uh, refers to all believers. I think it's very clear in the context. Um, uh, you could look at similar teaching of Jesus in the preceding chapters leading up to the Olivet Discourse. Matthew 20, 16, Matthew 22, uh, 14. In these passages, Jesus uses the same elect. Basically, uh, he says in Matthew 20, 16 and 20. Uh, 22, many are called, but few are chosen. That is, few are elect. And what he's saying here is that there's a remnant principle that although the gospel call is universal in nature, Jesus died that whosoever will may come. He's the propitiation not only for our sins, but the sins of the entire world. Only those who receive the gift of eternal life by faith alone will actually appropriate that gift. And Jesus is saying that it's for those 
that, that are his, his elect, his chosen ones, as it were, that this seven-year period indeed will mercifully come to an end so that those who survived by hiding out in the hills, that is, those who endured to the end, will get to physically inhabit the kingdom in their earthly flesh and bones bodies. And those who've been martyred during that time, and indeed throughout church history, will get to experience the kingdom in their glorified bodies. But it's for their sake, it's for their sake that uh, these days will be shortened. And then you go on to verse 23, and Jesus says, Then if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Now this is, again, we've talked about this in the previous three videos, particularly in the first video, but this whole idea of deception is a theme that, that runs start to finish throughout the Olivet Discourse. And I'll take a moment just to kind of review the significance of that. But remember, uh, Satan is a liar and the father of lies, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one, 1 John 5 tells us. And this is he's the prince of the power of the air, the prince of this world, the prince of demons, and, 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 and this is a, an evil age. And it's getting worse and worse, Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 3.13. And so by the time you get to this final seven-year period at the end of the age before the kingdom comes, uh, of course deception is going to reach an all-time high, unprecedented high. And with Satan indwelling the Antichrist, as I believe he will from Daniel chapter 8 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, he's going to have even more power to deceive. And so its deception is going to be so powerful that during this seven-year period when absolute mayhem and uh, pandemonium and chaos is taking place on earth, everyone, believers and unbelievers alike, uh, are going to be looking for the return of the Messiah. And uh, unbelievers in particular are going to be easy prey for the deception of the devil to start following false Christs. And that's why Jesus says, I'm telling you beforehand, watch out. There are going to be people saying, here, I'm the Christ, or there's the Christ, but don't believe them. Don't believe them. And he says the deception is going to be so great that if it were possible, even the elect could be saved. He goes on to say in verse 26, therefore, if they say to you, uh, look, he, he's in the desert, th then don't go out there. It's just a, it's a ploy. It's a trick. Or look, he's in the inner rooms. Don't believe it. So remember, what the situation at this time is there will be many, many souls that have been saved due to the witness of the 144,000 and, and their converts who then become part of the missionary force. And uh, Revelation tells us there's going to be people from every nation, tribe, tongue, and language that trust the Lord Jesus and get saved by believing the gospel. And, but, and many of them will be martyred, but many will not. And I believe he's largely speaking to the believing remnant that will be alive on planet Earth during that time. And as we know today in the present church age, believers are certainly not immune to the deception of the devil. Sadly, we live in an apostate time when many churches are just jumping on bandwagons and gobbling up anything that glitters thinking it's gold. Uh, and that uh, is a shame. But it's not going to be any different during... Uh, the tribulation period. Believers during the tribulation period, though they're not part of the church, they too will be subject to the potential deception. And, and so they are going to be so desperately looking for the return of their Lord to rescue them from the evil times of the tribulation that when someone puts on a good costume and says, hey, the Christ, he's out there. He's going to meet at this stadium. You ought to go see him. The people are going to line up in droves to go see him, only to find when they get there that their uh, necks are put in a noose or put on the chopping block and they are uh, in a guillotine and they are martyred. Um, and of course that won't impact uh, their eternal destiny any more than people, believers today who die under deception uh, are impacted. You know, our eternal home in heaven is secure. When Jesus says, I give you eternal life, you shall never perish. But certainly you want to watch out for that. So I believe Jesus is, is saying to them, don't fall prey to this deception someday. So that's verses 15 to 26, and it's section 4 of this Olivet Discourse, and Jesus is describing uh, detailed signs about the second half of the tribulation. And in our next video, we're going to look at section 5, where Jesus is going to then really zoom in on that precise moment, that precise day, 
when he comes back. And that's what the disciples really are lo- were looking for. They said, Lord, what's going to be the sign of your coming? When will the end of the age be? When will the kingdom come? We can't wait, Lord. We're so eager to rule and reign with you. When's it going to happen? Now, they didn't know at the time that they were asking and at the time that Jesus was answering here in this Olivet Discourse that there would be a delay of so far 2,000 years before the inauguration of the kingdom. Jesus had hinted at the delay in Luke 19 a few days earlier uh, when he had said, hey, uh, you know, there's going to be a delay. The king is going to go away for a while to get the kingdom, and he'll come back later. And while he's gone, you need to be busy. They didn't understand all of the implications of that parable in Luke 19, 11 to 30. They didn't understand uh, you know, that the church was going to be given birth here in a few weeks. They didn't understand that after Christ's resurrection, he would ascend to the right hand of the throne of God for a period of time, only to come back later uh, and usher in the kingdom. They certainly didn't un- did not understand that they would not themselves get to experience the earthly kingdom, uh, in their physical bodies anyway. Uh, they thought that he was going to come back in their lifetime. Uh, but that's what Jesus is talking about. And so, in, in the next section that we're going to look at in the next video, he actually gets to the pivotal moment when he describes what it will be like when he splits the eastern sky and comes back. And we'll look at that uh, beginning with the next section. Uh, let's pray together. Father, we do thank you so much for uh, your word and, and, and how clear and detailed it is uh, as you reveal to us the way things will unfold in the future. And Lord, help us to be students of the word and to take what you've given us and, and use it to motivate us to look up and be watchful, to long for your appearing, as the Apostle Paul said in his last letter, uh, so that we might uh, be rewarded uh, someday in the kingdom. And so, Father, we, uh, we give you this time. Use this teaching for your honor and for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.